Hey everyone, I'm James Montemagno, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you to talk about sort of a personal project that I've been working on for a long time um, that actually turned into something really neat. It was a mobile application that needed a powerful backend service, but I didn't want to run you know, different databases and I didn't want to have to run different servers. So I leveraged Azure functions with my Xamarin mobile applications for iOS and Android to create these mobile serverless applications. And that what I, that's what I want to talk about today, taking mobile development serverless with Xamarin and Azure functions. Now, I'm James Montemagno. I'm a principal program manager lead for the .NET community here at Microsoft. I've worked on the Xamarin team for nearly seven years now. And my team's entire goal is to help grow and nurture the .NET community. And my love and passion is mobile development, specifically with Xamarin. I love every single bit of it, being able to take my C Sharp and .NET knowledge and build beautiful mobile applications for iOS and Android, and also create beautiful desktop and web applications too. And in fact, when you think about it, that's sort of what .NET is all about. It is your platform to build for absolutely anything. Regardless, if you want to build a desktop app, a web app, cloud, mobile game application, you're able to leverage any of the wonderful .NET programming languages, C Sharp, F Sharp, or VB, to build those beautiful applications and share logic across all of them. I found C Sharp and .NET over almost 15 years ago at this point, and I love that I'm able to take the knowledge that I learned and use wonderful tools like Visual Studio and VS Code to craft these applications. Now, here at Microsoft, we want to also ensure that you have essential tools for mobile success. And when it comes to .NET, of course, you want to be able to build beautiful native applications. You want to build, test, distribute, and learn. And you also want to integrate into an intelligent cloud. And that's why we have Xamarin, Azure DevOps, App Center, and GitHub, and also Microsoft Azure for everything that you need, really for essential success when it comes to mobile development. Now, when it comes to building applications, let's start there. Now, for me, being part of the Xamarin team for almost seven years, our goal and mission has always been to delight developers. And this is what I came into when I started mobile development with Xamarin. Xamarin enables you to leverage your C-sharp and .NET skills to take advantage and build beautiful native iOS, Android applications all in C-sharp and also share your application logic with other .NET applications, whether it be desktop for Mac or Windows or web or IoT or games. And you build out a big shared C-sharp business logic layer, but at the end of the day, you get a beautiful, high-performant native application. But as the years have gone on, we've really focused on enabling developers to build cross-platform applications. And that's why the team is dedicated to ensuring that you have essential libraries that enable you not only to get access to iOS and Android APIs, but to build out cross-platform native user interface and access those native APIs for iOS and Android from your shared business logic. And that's where Xamarin Forms and Xamarin Essentials comes in. Here we can see that you'll always have your business logic on the bottom. That's your models, view models, RESTful service calls. But then you have Xamarin Forms, which is cross-platform native user interface, it gives you an entire MVVM framework to use. And then you have Xamarin Essentials, another library from an amazing team of developers here at Microsoft, giving you access to over 70 native features, such as uh, camera, connectivity, um, picking folders and files, um, vibration, text-to-speech, all from shared cross-platform APIs. So this means that as a developer, you have access to build cross-platform native UIs, access native APIs for each platform, all from 100% shared code. But you always have access to the underlying native platform from C-sharp for iOS, Android, or the desktop operating systems. And this is what's truly awesome. Let's talk really quick about that native API access. And this is something that has been near and dear to my heart, but also Xamarin's heart as its core foundation for many years, is enabling you to access these great APIs from C-sharp. Now, as the different operating systems have gone on, a lot of these APIs are similar. So instead of, instead of having to learn iOS APIs, Android APIs, Windows APIs, Mac APIs, 
the team came together and they built Xamarin Essentials, which gives you a single API to access those native features. And there's about 70 of them built in. It's completely open source under MIT, on, available on GitHub as well. So you can go and check out the source code and you just add it as a dependency NuGet into your project. In fact, every single Xamarin application, when you do file new, has Xamarin Essentials built right into it. Now, when it comes to the user interface, I talked about Xamarin Forms. It basically does very similar things to Xamarin Essentials, but instead of native platform features, it gives you native API access for user interface. So instead of having to create three different UIs, you create one beautiful cross-platform UI with Xamarin Forms. So for example, over here on iOS, we have a UI activity indicator on Android, a progress bar. Well, instead of making that twice, you create one cross-platform XAML user interface and you get one API with Xamarin Forms called Activity Indicator. Over here for a slider, you have UI slider and seek bar. Well, you get one slider. They have their own properties. They have their own names. But at the end of the day, what Xamarin Forms does is it gives you that abstraction while still leveraging the native APIs for the user interface. So even though you're accessing creating a Xamarin Forms slider, what's displayed to your users is the native UI slider and the native seek bar on Android. And of course, for Mac and Windows as well. So before we get uh, any further and talk about serverless, let's just go and let me do a quick Xamarin demo over here. So let's hop over to my desktop. All right, here I am. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Visual Studio 2019. And what we're going to do is just create a brand new Xamarin project. So I'm going to say a new project. And here I'm going to get all my project templates that I have. And I'm going to select mobile app with Xamarin Forms. I could, of course, add on other projects like TV or watch or different iOS extensions but this is going to give me my base project. So here we have this brand new dialog that shows me what type of application I'm going to build. Let's just do a new blank application here and just hit create. What this will do is it'll give me everything I sort of need for my iOS, Android, and windows projects. So I can start to be productive right away and also have a shared, uh, backend with my user interface and all my models and view models and things like that. So let's see what this looks like over here. I'm going to go ahead and collapse these down and zoom in here. Here we have our .NET standard project, which is where my user interface and any of my models, view model services are going to be. And I have some pages in here. So I have a main page XAML and my app XAML. So these are some shared user interface code here. Then down here, we have our Android, iOS, and our Windows projects. And these are our head projects. So if I wanted to access native APIs there, I could go ahead and write some code in those projects and get access to the native APIs in C Sharp. But for most of our work, we're just going to do everything in our XAML pages here. So what I'm going to do is um, just first start over on Windows. And let me just go ahead and compile this up. And what we'll see over here is I have um, a XAML page that has a stack layout as a frame here that says welcome to Xamarin forms with the background color. I have a few labels here. It's kind of telling me how to start my development and I'm just going to hit debug over here. And what this is going to do is just start my application right on the desktop. There we go. And let's just go ahead and let me just pin this over here and bring this over here and move this over here. There we go. So I have my app on the right hand side. And the first thing I want to show you is on the left hand tree in visual studio is my live visual tree. This is going to show me all of my elements that are on this page. So I can actually click on it, go to it. What's really nice here is that I can also, um, come in, I can start to modify my user interface right here. So let's say I want this to be pink. I get rich IntelliSense, uh, as I sort of, um, hover and update on this, we can see that it updates in real time. I can say, welcome to Xamarin forms. And I'll say, hello, AZ dev conf. And then I'll update and I don't even have to hit save. I immediately get that really tight iteration loop directly on my PC. So I have all of these changes here and this is really nice. This is iterative hot reload. It's sort of hot reload version two. And what I can do is prove that this is actually just doing a diff because let's add an entry in here. There we go. And I can say, hello, everyone, exclamation point. And now what I'll do is I'll change this back to, let's say blue. 
And notice that over here inside my application, the state is saved, which is really neat, while the background color has been updated automatically for me. So I get all my features here, my live visual tree, my hot reload, everything that I need. And when I'm ready to go to iOS and Android, I just simply set iOS or Android as the startup. And I can come in and I can select one of the devices and hit debug. What this will do is now take my changes in my application, compile up a native Android application, and then deploy it right to my Android emulator. And the teams worked really hard to ensure that the Android emulators work really great with Hyper-V. So if you're doing Docker deployments or other things like that, it's gonna work great out of the box. Or if you're using AMD, it will also work great there. So like I said, this is gonna go through some iteration. It's gonna go and uh, deploy uh, the application. We can see it's actually signing, it's copying. It's gonna start a real live debug session on my Android emulator. So let's go ahead and uh, bring that up over here. There we go. It says, hello, AZ DevConf. I get the same exact user interface controls that I would expect um, inside of Visual Studio. I get my live visual tree, so I can tap around. It takes me right to the code. Again, I can say hot pink, hit save. I get the adornment there. It updates in real time for me. So I can start working and iterating on my application, regardless if on iOS, Android, or Windows. And if I'm on iOS, you can actually just take your iOS device, plug it into your Windows machine, and use a technology called um, iOS Hot Restart that enables you to rapidly iterate on your iOS application directly over USB for Xamarin Forms, which is really neat. So there you go, a very quick introduction. What a Xamarin Forms application looks like? Uh, let's head back over to the slides really quick. All right, now that we have our application, let's talk about what you do next, which is build powerful backends. And that's where Microsoft Azure comes in. Now, Azure has tons of great SDKs that you can integrate directly into your mobile applications today. So things like data from Azure SQL, Azure Storage, Cosmos DB, to machine learning, to cognitive services, to different app service APIs, and other things like Azure Search, Service Bus, Identity, all are compatible because it will work with any .NET application. That means if you're using cool technologies like SignalR for real-time communication, those SDKs are gonna work inside of your Xamarin applications. So you can leverage all of this existing infrastructure and knowledge directly in your Xamarin applications. Now I specifically wanna talk about serverless. And when I started off, you know, I didn't want to have to worry about, you know, spinning up different web service APIs and doing different connectors and looping in. And I really wanted to use the latest and greatest technology. So I wanted to think about taking my application serverless. And this is where um, Azure Functions come in. It's an amazing service, part of Azure, that enables you to build out local event-driven modules or functions, obviously, if you will, um, that can scale on demand. This is neat because you don't have to think about how many VMs do I have? How, how am I scaling out or up or across? Azure Functions does that all for you. You scale and you pay for only what you consume. So the milliseconds of time that your functions are running. One of the coolest parts is that you can develop them directly in Visual Studio or Visual Studio for Mac or even Visual Studio Code, develop them locally on your machine before you deploy to Azure. And this is one of the things that I super duper love about functions is that you can not only develop them locally, but you can develop them in C Sharp. In fact, Azure Functions supports all sorts of different languages out there like JavaScript and Java and a bunch of other ones. But I love that I can actually share and use C Sharp and .NET directly on my machine with Azure Functions and then deploy it and then connect directly from my mobile applications or any other application because it's just a function. Now, when I say event-driven, what I mean by that is that there are triggers or how does this thing start? Um, so there's a lot of different scenarios that, um, that work with Azure Functions. So for example here, let's say that you have a PDF file um, that you're going to add to blob storage. Well, that could trigger off an Azure function that grabs that PDF file, runs it through cognitive services for OCR, and then puts it into a SQL database automatically. So the trigger here 
has an input, which is that PDF file, and an output, which is that SQL database entry. Another one is you have a mobile application that's calling a web API that then inputs data into Cosmos DB, maybe perhaps then triggers off data transfer functions, and then sends a notification back to all the mobile applications when it's done automatically for you. So this way you're not doing the processing inside of your mobile application. It's just a function waiting out there to be triggered. Or how about this one? Maybe just a scheduled task that automatically runs every 15 minutes to just remove duplicated data entry inside your database. It's an amazing way of cleaning up data all with Azure Functions. So you can use these Azure Functions directly from your mobile applications by calling them or in as a complement, right? You could have them upload, anyone could upload a file into blob storage but your mobile application could too. And then it could then fire off, resize something or do something with that file. So before we talk about combining the two, let's just go ahead and do an Azure Functions demo here. So what I'm gonna do is close out of this Visual Studio. We'll just hit don't save there. And I'm gonna open up a new instance of Visual Studio here, and we're gonna create an Azure Function. So again, I'm gonna say create new project. Now here, I also have an Azure function. So I've added the Azure um, uh, SDK. I'm gonna hit next and just say function app two. That sounds good. There we go. And here, this is what is gonna give us all of the different triggers, okay? So I have just an empty one, which I don't want that. There's a blob trigger, Cosmos DB, HTTP trigger, a queue trigger, service bug trigger, bus trigger, timer trigger. And there's all of these different triggers here. Let's just do something very simple, right? Which is an HTTP trigger. And this is normally what a mobile application would be calling. So I'm going to hit create here. And this will create my Azure function for me directly from Visual Studio. So here we go. Now, uh, up over here, it's just a single project. Here we go, function two. Um, and I have a file called a function one. You can have as many functions inside of a, of a single function. There's sort of a grouping. It's a grouping of, of actual functions inside of a project. So you can have as many as you want. You can have different settings and, and everything will run here. But let's look at this code. Uh, if I go ahead and drop this down, we'll see that I have a function, which is called function one. So that's, that's the actual method that'll get called. Um, this is a, just it has a run method. And, and the method name is not actually very important. It's just run is the default. What this will do is it'll have an HTTP trigger. So this is saying that this function will get triggered based off of an HTTP trigger. And that's how it will run. And this here will um, have an authorization level of function. So when I deploy it into Azure, it'll give me a unique URL and key that is required to call this Azure function. You can also mark it as admin anonymous system or user. So you can play into the different authentication systems that you have. And I even get an I logger. Now what this function does by default is it takes in the URL, it looks for the query of name, takes that, it serializes it up, deserializes the object. And then what it does is just prints it out and says, hello, blah, blah, blah. This was triggered successfully. So what I can do is add a breakpoint here and run it locally. It's kind of cool. And this is going to just run the Azure function CLI locally on my machine. So this is running here. Everything's looking good. And it gives me a full URL of localhost 7071 API function. You can rename this. You can map it to whatever you want. So let me go ahead and just pull this up uh, over here. Just go ahead and run it here. I'm going to type it in. I'm going to add a query of name of James. Now what we can see is that this got hit, it's going to log that out to the system. So if I bring this up, we can see that there's a console log right here. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the query and the name here is James, cause it was a query from my, my URL. This is gonna read any information that's coming from the stream, if there's data and there is no data, so just gonna be name. And it's going to basically just print it out. So here um, says, hello, James. This HTTP trigger was successful or right there, boom.
and it just called. So anybody could call this if I deployed it and I could then process it and do whatever I want. All right, let's do something uh, a little bit cooler with uh, the Azure functions. So, so what I'm going to do over here is close this down and close on this Azure function. And let's create one more. I'm going to go open another Visual Studio here. And we're going to create another project. But this time, instead of doing an HTTP trigger, I really want to show you the power of Azure Functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a blob trigger here. So this is for Azure storage. Um, and that's what I would, would want to um, go ahead and use. And here we can see it's going to look for anything that's coming into samples work items. Okay. So I'm going to hit create. And what this will do is give me another function inside of, of this project. And I could have added another function previously, but I'm just going to go ahead and just do it right here um, with this one. So again, we're going to get our Azure function. We have our, you know, single project. We have our function here and we have different settings. But if we look, I, uh, it looks a little bit different. Let me go and drop this down a little bit for us here. And what we see is that instead of a HTTP trigger, we have a blob trigger. And that means that it's going to be connected to our Azure storage. And by default, when I debug locally, it'll be my local Azure storage Explorer. And whenever a new file is added, it will automatically trigger and pass in a stream of that file to the function for me automatically. So here it will log the information and then it will go ahead and, and print it out. Now, what I can also do is write a little bit more code here. So for example, uh, what I'll do is let's just go ahead and copy some code in that basically just comes in and reads the blob, reads the text, and then outputs it to the log information. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and boot up this Azure function here. And what's neat about developing locally is that I not only can test this function uh, for HTTP, but I can also use the Azure storage uh, Explorer here. Over here, I have a, I have a blob container emulator with the samples work items right here, which is kind of cool. Um, and I've created another blob container called process, and we'll use that a little bit later. But here, what I'm able to do is let me just go ahead and grab from my desktop this file. There's there's like it says hello world, like nothing fancy. I'm just gonna go ahead and drop it in here. Okay. Now it's probably so fast. Um, that I forgot to put a breakpoint, uh, but if we look over here, we can see it says hello world, just dropped it right out. So let's go ahead and, and delete this one and let's go ahead and add it again. So we can add the breakpoint here Go ahead and drop this over Boop. and you can see how fast it is, right? It just immediately hit it. The name of it is new text document .txt. The length over here is 13 bytes. And if I add another breakpoint down here, remove this one. We'll see that the info that's coming in is, uh, is hello world. So we can go ahead and pin that on here and there it is. Hello world. Okay. With new lines apparently too. And then I'm just going to print that off to the line and there we go. Just like that. I'm able to add this into my, into my, um, my, my emulator here and get it running. I could do a bunch of other things, right? I could have processed that text, added it into a database. It could have been an image. I could have processed that image. I could have done a lot more. Let's do something a little bit different here. Um, cause I wanted to show the power of not only adding files, but what if I was to take that file and then output it somewhere else? So do it in and an out. So here's what we're going to do is the first thing we're going to do is I am going to add another, um, parameter onto this function. And this is going to be a blob. So instead of a blob trigger, we have a blob. Now what's cool here is that the blob trigger will automatically happen for me whenever a blob is added. But here I'm going to say, I'm going to write to this blob. I could have as many as I wanted. I could also have read blobs and I could read a very specific file every single time. But what this is going to do is it's going to say, I am going to output a blob to this process container with the same name that was passed in. So what I can do here, for example, is not only log it, but let's go ahead 
and simply add an encoding and say, get the bytes over here, hello from code, and then output that into the out blob, okay? So every time I take it in, I could go ahead and do this. And in fact, what I could do is I could, you know, maybe take this info and then add it in there so we can bind the two together, right? So I'm taking the file, processing the file, taking the data, adding it to a new file whenever that trigger is occurring here. So let's go ahead and boot this up again. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is open it over here. Now let's make sure there's no files in here. There's nothing in here, but here's the sample work. Let's go ahead and drag and drop this file in here, just like that. Got it. It's got the info, which is hello world. And now it's going to write that new blob out. So here it has the file. I go to process. I'm going to hit refresh. There's the new text document. If I double click and open this, what we're going to see is that it says, hello world, hello from code. We've literally taken it from a trigger, parsed that data, created a new file in a different Azure storage blob container for me and written that contents out automatically. Now, these are very rudimentary examples of just some of the things you can do with Azure functions, but I wanted to show you the power in just a few lines of code, me being able to add and access these triggers and blob inputs and outputs. And you can connect to a bunch of different services, not just the ones that I listed earlier. Well, let's head back over uh, to the slides really quick here. There we go. Cool. So now that we know a little bit about mobile application with Xamarin and serverless backends with Azure functions, we can combine the two together to make something very powerful. And, uh, earlier this year, um, animal crossing, a game for the Nintendo switch came out. And in my spare time, I combine these two pieces of technology to create an application called Island tracker and Island tracker has a very simple premise. The idea is that, uh, inside of animal crossing, there are this sort of turnip prices, something that you buy and sell in the game, and you can go to other friends, um, towns and islands and buy and sell. So every day I was text messaging all my friends and people have WhatsApp groups and things like that. But what I wanted to do was make a very easy to have an application that I could share my data with my friends. And that's where Island tracker came off of. My goals with this application were to create a beautiful, great looking cross-platform iOS and Android app to be able to track weekly turnip prices and get predictions, sync my data with a backend, have a simple friend system with no login, which I'll talk about here as we talk about this backend and also be able to view and synchronize our, my friends statuses and prices throughout the week and every single day. And going forward, I wanted to ensure the back end that I picked and the, the front end UI that I picked could also allow me to add push notifications and even add desktop support down the road. So I wanted to ensure that as I was building this application and picking my different um, technologies that I could implement all of this into my app. And that's where Island tracker came from. As you can see here, I have a beautiful iOS and an Android application, um, where users are able to parse and, and, and send and share their, um, their turnip prices for their towns or predictions or gate codes back and forth easily inside of the application. They can send friend requests. They can do a bunch of stuff back and forth. Now for the back end, it's very simple. For some reason in my mind, I wanted no databases and I wanted no servers. That's, that's what I wanted. Uh, since I was building this in my spare time, I wanted to have uh, it'd be very, very simple to go off and, um, not have to worry about scaling up servers, scaling out servers. Um, and I didn't want to have to run an Azure SQL server all the time, uh, mostly because I wasn't really sure how popular the app would be. So I didn't want to overinvest, but I wanted to give it a way that I could scale out in the future. And the cool part here is with Azure functions is that I could then switch backends at any time in the future. If I needed to swap to a database, if I needed to, but it could also scale on demand, which means if no one used my app, which would have been sad, I wouldn't have had to pay anything. If tons of people use my application, well, it would have only been, um, on demand pay per use. That was my goal because I wanted to use Azure functions. So what I did is I combined the power of Azure functions with Azure table storage. 
And Azure Table Storage is a really cool kind of key value table row column um, storage solution. It's, um, you know, kind of like, it's not NoSQL, it's not SQL, it's table storage. Uh, and it has a unique API that enables you to add uh, rows um, that have columns associated with them. And I wanted to have this type of architecture. My Azure function, or sorry, my Azure function would sit in the middle between my mobile application and my Azure table storage. And the reason it could do that and sit between, because I never wanted my mobile app to call directly into my table storage. I didn't want to have to process. I wanted to make sure that, you know, my um, Azure server, my services here with functions could scale on demand. And that if I needed to change things in the future, no matter what version of the mobile application the users were running, I could change the backend out seamlessly and still have it be secure. So I wanted to have this. So let me show you a little bit of what this looks like in regard to a very simple property and simple data structure, which is a user. And a user in my application has a private key and a public key. And the um, public key is saved on the, the server. It's shared with friends and a private key is stored securely inside the mobile application. Uh, whenever the mobile app starts up, these are generated automatically. Now that private key though is not stored. Um, um, it doesn't need to be stored necessarily. Um, it only needs to be used for server communication. So both of these keys are on the server for the user, but only the public key is shared to other users where the private key is used for communication for authentication. That public key, like I said, is the friend system sharing data with friends. It's the only thing that gets shared with other people and the private keys stay private. Now, what I also wanted to do was ensure that it was easy to create codes and, and, and also share that with friends and that these private keys would be unique. So I just use GUIDs uh, and these GUIDs are generated again when the app is started and they're stored in the keychain uh, via Xamarin Essentials automatically um, with secure storage. So very, very simple. Finally, like I said, it's tied to the device, so it can be transferred. Now, if I wanted to in the future, I could add in an authentication system with Twitter or Facebook or Microsoft, but I wanted to keep it very simple. You install the app, you have an account, and you can upload um, information about your account, like your name, and you can share with friends, basically. So as soon as you install the app, you're done. There's nothing to sign up for necessarily. So let me show you what this looks like and how my back end communicates with my front end. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to close down this and let's go ahead and bring up um, my uh, Island Tracker application. This is going to look a little bit bigger because I have a lot of different projects in here. The first thing is that we'll note is that I have some projects down here. I have my iOS and my Android application right down here. And I also have that big shared .NET standard project. But instead of just having my views inside of here, I have view models, I have services like a data service, helpers, controls, converters, models, everything inside of here. But I want you to also note that I have my Azure functions right here, and I'm actually sharing my, um, my data model objects between both my Azure functions and my mobile applications. So anything that's stored up into the Azure table storage is the same exact data object as um, what is displayed in my mobile application. So when I open up user, here's my user. It's an island name, it's a name, the fruit that it has, the time zone, status, friend code, public key, dodo code, status inside of here. It also has a turnip price, which has different information about the turnip. And these data objects are going to get passed up into my server automatically for me. So it makes it very easy to go back and forth because all of my data structures are the same. As soon as I add a new property, it's automatically going to be synchronized between my back end and my front end. So like I said, I have a lot of different, different, you know, projects and properties inside of this shared code. So you can see lots of pages, right? inside of here. I have lots of view models associated with these inside of here too, but I also have some Azure functions. So the one I want to show you is create profile. 
So I use HTTP triggers for all of my different communication between my back end and my front end. Now the difference here is that I still use an HTTP trigger here. This is going to be create profile, but I also then say, give me a cloud table for my Azure uh, table storage, and it's going to be the user table. And when I get that, it's going to enable me to do different reads and writes. So I can say cloud table, I can create async, I can execute async, I can batch up queries, I can see if it exists immediately from that code. Now I do a bunch of different parsing for the different backend and front end, the, the, the token for authentication. But what it comes down to is I pass it a JSON blob of data. And then as long as it's valid, what I do is I create a user entity that's going to be stored into my um, table over here, which here's my user entity. Here's what it looks like. It's a table entity, which comes from the Azure table storage SDK and it has some information about it that's being passed back and forth. And then what I do is I do an insert or update on that data object and I insert it into the database, or in this case, it's not a database, but it's table storage explorer. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this as my startup project, and we're just going to go ahead and run it over here. Now, um, this is going to give me access to be able to test everything locally on my machine. You can see right here, it has created all of these different API backends for me to call. And some of them um, also take in parameters like a public key or a public key and a friend public key to do um, removing of friends or getting of friends. So we follow RESTful services here. Um, but some of them are as simple as say, give me my friends. And it gives me all my friends for my public key back as long as I'm validated there. So that's going to be running locally. Now over inside of my mobile application, I have a data service. And the data service is going to call and parse that data up back into my backend or my Azure function. So here I create my user object. I get my public key from the key store. I see if I've been registered or not. And I call either update profile or create profile. And what this does is just simply call off to API slash create profile with the code and it calls post async. And that's just going to make a very simple HTTP request via post gets the content, sends it up to the back end. So let me go ahead and open up the application here. I started this up. It's a brand new install. So what it's going to do is going to ask me for a profile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my table storage explorer. And what we have here, similar to our blob containers is tables. So I've generated a friend, friend request, and a user. So under user, we have nothing in here just yet. There we go. Here I can say James. I'll say cool island. We can pick a fruit over here. I'll say orange. And um, I have no friend code. I'm just going to hit create. Now, what we'll see is that if I pull up my Azure function here, we can see that I've logged that the create profile has been called. That's kind of cool. And then if I go ahead and refresh the data here, whoa, look at that. Immediately, we can see that I have data directly in here. I have my different keys of my application for my user, James, Cool Island, the fruit ID, and an emoji over here. Now, what I'm able to do in my mobile application is not only you know um, create my profile, but I can go in and I can set what my different turnip prices were. So if I say it was 60, 60, I can look at my predictions here. Uh, up top, we can go ahead and pull this down. There we go. My different predictions that are coming in. I can go to my different days. I can hit sync here. It's going to sync really fast. I can hit refresh and we'll see that now I've synchronized that data up into my Azure table storage, which is really cool. So if I look once again into the application code, I have that update profile and update turnip prices. So when I hit that turnip price update, it pass in very same thing. It went, it grabbed the user table. It said, I called the update turnip prices function, got the JSON, grabbed the data, and then updated the user data data and merged in the user entity. And I was good to go. It was very, very simple. 
to add that data back and forth. And that's really how easy it is to create this function. Like I just called an HTTP endpoint. I didn't do anything special. I just went up, called it, pass it data, and the Azure function handled all the heavy lifting for me automatically, which is quite amazing. Now let's go a little bit further because there's a lot of other things that you can do um, with Azure um, table storage because you can have multiple tables. They can have crisscrossing information inside of them and they're very powerful. So what I did is I created a friend system here and the friend system is really unique. What it does is it enables you to easily um, create friends, sort of like sort of Facebook where someone requests to be your friends and you approve it. So the idea here is here's me, here's James right here, this purple James. I'm gonna share a link kind of like to my profile with a friend and let's call that friend Maddie. Maddie's presenting here at AZConf and we work together. So she has Animal Crossing too. So I'm gonna give her my link. Now here's Maddie here. And what she's gonna do is click on that and say, oh, cool. Like James looks cool. I'm gonna send you a friend request. I'm gonna get that friend request and I'm gonna approve or deny it. And if I approve it, we're friends and we're good to go. If I deny it, then we're not friends, but I'm easily able to basically say, here's my URL, send me a friend request, and then automatically approve or deny in the system. And how this all works is via um, Xamarin Forms deep linking ability with custom URIs. So inside this application, it uses the shell navigation service, which is URI based. And the idea here is very simple. Let's say I had a list of, of cities and I wanted to navigate over to a detail page. Well, instead of constructing an entire page and a whole data object, I really just want to go to that detail page so I can give it a URL of detail. What I can do to go backwards is just do dot dot and go backwards. But a powerful part of the navigation service is that I can navigate deep into the pages via query parameters, just like I showed you with the Azure functions earlier. So I can say, go to the detail page and give it this city ID, which is pretty awesome. So inside my page, I can say, Hey, go to this page. Here's the city, set the ID, handle it all for me automatically. And what you can do is you can use custom URLs through your Xamarin applications to deep link to specific pages. And that's what I did with my friend request. Now here's what this looks like. It's kind of long and it's a little scary, but this is what I would be sending to Maddie. It's very simple. The first part here is AC Island tracker. That's a custom URI data scheme that I am going to accept in my application. Then what I'm telling it is to automatically navigate to the friends slash invite page. So when this is received, it will automatically through Xamarin forms, navigate to friends to invite, and then go ahead and pass it this information, the ID, which is my public ID and just a display name. So just that way I don't have to do any lookups. I just pass it automatically in my code. Now what's cool here is that Xamarin forms, I can handle all of that in one single place. Inside of the application, I get this little on app link request received. And here, what I'm doing is I'm going to go ahead and automatically parse the public key, make sure I'm not myself that uh, opening it up. I'm then going to go ahead and say, go to, and it's going to go automatically to the friend slash invite and pass that data across. And here's what that looks like in action. Let me play this little video here. There we go. I clicked on the link, it went to the friends page, clicked on the link, went to the friends page automatically, which is really cool. Let me show you what that looks like here in action. So what I'm going to do is I still have my Azure function running here and I have my main, um, one here and let's open another emulator and open up Island tracker over here. So now we have two different devices and this doesn't matter if it was, you know, iOS or Android, there's both happen to be Android. But over here, I'm just going to go ahead and let's create um, a profile. And I'm going to say this is Maddie. And this is going to be um, Xamarin Town. And let's just say that Maddie has uh, cherries or, yeah, just apples are fine. There we go. And hit create. 
This is going to call that back end. And I want you to note here that um, what we'll see as I refresh is now we have Maddie inside of here, right there, which is cool, right? So here's what's going to happen is I'm going to pop back up my Android emulator and Maddie's now right here. And let's go ahead and maybe let's just update her prices over here. We'll say 60 and 100 and save those up. Good to go. And now let's become friends. So we can see here we have no friends, but I'm going to go ahead and share my friend code here with Maddie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say copy to clipboard. And what I'm going to do over here is um, it's saved in my clipboard, but I'm just going to go ahead and say add manually and hit submit. So what this is going to do is now say, hey, um, do you want to add James as a friend? And I'm going to say, yes, add friend. And it says friend request sent. You will see your friend as soon as they accept the friend request on their app. That's kind of cool. If I look back over into my back end, I have a friend request uh, table. I'm going to hit refresh. And we can see that this is over here a partition key and row key saying that this user would like to be this user's friend. So they're only different by one and two in my, in my keys here. So now when I go back over into my other emulator, let's pull that back up and go into um, request. I can refresh this and I can see I have one friend here. That's kind of cool. I'm going to go into it and it says, Maddie would like to be your friend. So let's go ahead and approve it and just say, yes, there we go and close it out. Now, just like that, if we go back into the back end one more time, I'm going to go ahead and clear it out. That friend has friend request has been deleted. And when I look at friends, we can see that each of these users are friends of each other. Basically one and two and two and one are the friends here. Now, when I come back over and I hit refresh, there we go. Just like that, I've become friends immediately in the system, all using serverless compute and Azure functions with Azure functions and leveraging Azure table storage. I didn't have to create an account. It's all created for me. I didn't have to log in. I didn't have to do anything. All the friends codes, everything is done directly through this. I can go in, I can remove friends. I have everything that I need. I can update it and I can get different predictions as I go, which is really, really neat. So this is super powerful. I think that, that this type of development is super quick. It enables you to scale out your services and be super productive directly on your machine here. Now let's go ahead and close these down and let's wrap it up. Now, hopefully what you've seen is that with Xamarin, you can build beautiful cross-platform native applications and share all of your business logic, your user interface and native integrations across the different operating systems. You can leverage powerful backend services with Azure functions to get those inputs and outputs that you may need across different services that Azure provide, like blob storage, Azure table storage, Cosmos DB, and a lot more. Best of all, you can run them all locally before you deploy them up to Azure or wherever else you want to deploy them. And then what I love, of course, about functions is that they scale on demand and you only pay for usage, which I think is delightful. So if the more you grow, the more it scales, the more you pay, obviously, but as it ups and flows throughout the day, you're good to go. There you go. I hope that you really, really enjoyed this presentation and that you're able to now leverage in, uh, Xamarin for building your mobile applications and also le leverage um, Azure Functions for serverless compute. You can find me everywhere on the internet at James Montemagna. You can send me an email, check out my blog, or just hit me up on Twitter. I also have a podcast called Merge Conflict that you can learn about more. And of course, right over here, I have everything open source on my GitHub page. So when you go to github.com slash James Montemagno, the entire source code is here for you. You can run it all locally on your machine, Mac or PC, and you'll be good to go. I hope that you really enjoyed this session, that you reach out with any questions, uh, and that you go off and build awesome applications, and then please tell me all about them. Have an awesome conference, and thanks for tuning in.